Asante sana bwana PCS tafadhali tunaweza keti. Thank you very much. Let's take our seats. <clears throat> um, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors present, High Commissioner, Development Partners, Friends, and the Tibet community, Hamjambo. Good morning. I had uh, the chair of this great institution, and she said she warmly welcomes us, only that it is very cold. <laughs> But uh, the welcome was very warm. I am very delighted to join you at the climax of these celebrations to mark a century of technical and vocational education and training in Kenya. As you may recall, I launched the celebration on 26 March this year, after which the Tibet at 100 Torch has traveled throughout Kenya, traversing every county in every part of our republic. As it returns to the host institution, the flame's journey through our country has shown us there is much to celebrate in the history of Tibet in Kenya. From the initial government African school in Machakos, which existed informally the first formal Tibet Institute was established here in Kabete in 1924. And we couldn't have celebrated 100 years of Tibet in a better place than in this Kabete Institute. <clears throat> Before independence, seven, other, seven others were established in Mawego, Nairobi, Sigalagala, Kaiboi, Thika, Machakos, and Meru. Today, our Tibet system includes 320 public Tibet colleges, 24 of which are national polytechnics, while four cater for special needs. Additionally, there are 1,100 vocational training centers in our counties, and we are developing 16 new TVCs to fulfill our policy of having one each in every constituency. As was said by Madam Piers earlier, it is my commitment that every constituency in Kenya must have a Tibet so that we equalize the fortunes of every county and every constituency and give a chance to as many of our young people as we can. Initially, Tibet institutions were mandated to equip young people with practical and technical skills, which enabled them to become part of such historic projects as the Kenya-Uganda Railway. The relentless expansion of Tibet in Kenya is proof of our economy's insatiable appetite for industry-driven relevant skills and the increasing demand for specialized training which aligns the education of young Kenyans with existing and emerging opportunities. As demonstrated by the FLAMES itinerary, no part of Kenya has been left behind in this demand for technical and vocational training. In fact, today, we celebrate the enduring promise of Tibet and the robustness of its capacity to connect young people with opportunities throughout our economy. We also celebrate its inclusivity, a world of possibility for all, and a hope that leaves nobody behind. The numbers affirm our confidence that indeed, Tibet is the master key to the door of opportunities for young Kenyans. I know Tibet has positioned itself that if education is the key, then Tibet is the master key. And I think that cannot be more apt. Six years ago, uh, correction, 10 years ago, in fact in 2013, we had only 89,000 students 
in our Tibet institutions. Today, we have close to 700,000 students in our Tibet institutions. It has grown almost tenfold. And it speaks to the possibilities that Tibet is offering to many young people across Kenya. I remember when I first, when I was Minister for Higher Education and I was pushing for Tibet, there was a lot of pushback then that formal education was much more superior to Tibet education. Today, I think we have equalized the fortunes of all Kenyans. The choices are now as open as they can get. You have students joining either Tibet or university equally, and they can sample opportunities also equally. And therefore, I am very proud of the journey that Tibet has made, especially in the last 10 years. Our bottom-up economic transformation agenda also ignited tremendous momentum in job creation, opening up thousands of lucrative opportunities in the technical and vocational fields in our priority strategic pillars of affordable housing, universal health coverage, digital economy, and agro-industrial production, and throughout every other sector, locally and abroad. At the same time, Reforms in our education sector, both in the competence-based curriculum and training, and in the transformation of higher education funding model, have promoted relevance, skills, and competitiveness, and also inclusivity. We are also intentional about developing and providing high-quality human resource to support Tibet. Humanity is now irrevocably plunged into the future of immense threats and crises that can only be surmounted by sustainable innovation and effective technology deployment against every risk and every challenge. The government is determined to ensure that Kenya is not left behind and that our young people remain at the forefront of global industrial and technical progress. Our education system has never been more essential and Tibet in particular is now a focal sector which must receive our full attention because we cannot afford to get it wrong. We must remember that our freedom struggle remains incomplete and the attainment of inclusive growth and broad-based prosperity is our best way of winning freedom from hunger, disease and want. Therefore, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the Africa Union's Agenda 2063, and our vision 2030 depend on our capacity to catalyze national transformation in a manner set out in the bottom-up transformation agenda. In other words, the freedom struggle of our time calls for a skills revolution driven by science, technology, and innovation. Consequently, we must supply our labor market with skilled, and innovative human capital in order to unlock the vast opportunities in key sectors such as agriculture, the blue economy, renewable energy, manufacturing, infrastructure development, mining, housing, and climate action. For these reasons, we continue to drive the transformation of Tibet system by implementing important reforms and developments, including I already issued instructions that the development, education, and training curriculum, assessment, and certification council, SIDAC, be reinstated and <laughs> takes over the role of examining our students, providing exams for our students, because it is the qualified body for it to make sure that our trainers are assessed on skills acquired and competencies achieved rather than on stories told. I, I think that that's really the basic tenet of why we pushed for, uh, for, for Tibet. I also must uh, say that uh, I am very proud of what we have decided on recognition of prior learning. 
it is an important tool of getting more people to be certified, especially when they have skills, especially when they have acquired those skills over time, and there's need for a framework, and I'm very happy that many institutions around Kenya, many Tibet institutions, are now implementing that program on recognition of prior learning as a government policy that then gives opportunity to many people to be certified and for them to be able to have the requisite um, papers to be able to further their careers. I have also, I'm very also happy that we have upgraded 13 technical training institutes and colleges to national polytechnics to give them also opportunity to be able to offer education at a higher level and to support the others for us to move uh, forward. I'm also happy on the elevation of Morenda Institute of Oil and Gas into a national polytechnic. Again, it gives us the opportunity to unlock the potential in the oil and gas space, and especially as we focus on how to deliver um, those products coming from that uh, sector into the economy. I am also very happy that um, the ministry is running with the implementation of the National Debt Blueprint 2020 to 2030. And that whole space where we are developing and implementing a dual training policy, which involves industry players in the training process. In fact, this morning, I listened to Kevin, one of the students who was um, taking us through uh, presentation. And Kevin told me that we need to balance between the training that we have in college and the opportunity we have to work in industry. And I think he was speaking to the policy of dual training. And therefore, if you wanted any validation that dual training is the way to go, I think even the students in these colleges are speaking the same language with us, that we need to do more to make sure that we connect what happens in class, what happens in our laboratories, what happens in our workshops, and what happens in industry. And that is the way to the future. And I want to encourage principals, and I want to encourage the ministry to work with industry. And I'm very happy with the partnership that has already been fashioned between the ministry and industry and our training colleges to provide opportunities for young people from these institutions to be able to be trained and to acquire the skills necessary for them to be job ready when they get out of college. Let me also confirm that on the funding model, we are working to make sure that especially children from, from vulnerable families are not left behind. It is very important that we leave nobody behind in this training and in this program and in providing education. We have doubled the budget for training in Tibet and in our universities, deliberately, because we want to give every child in Kenya an opportunity to learn. I know that there has been a bit of confusion, and I have asked the ministry to clarify that some of the letters sent to parents may indicate 200,000, 300,000, but that is not what a parent is expected to pay. That is the cost of the course. The government is going to make scholarship, it's going to make loan available, depending on the financial ability of parents or guardians or sponsors of students, so that we make it possible for government to support as many students as possible, and also make it possible for government to support students from vulnerable uh, families to the highest level possible. I also want to ask members of parliament to work with us on this program so that we can get the correct message out there 
that our intention is to make sure that our institutions have the requisite resources to run courses. I think in the past, Tibet institutions, managers of our Tibet institutions, managers of our universities were struggling because while government committed so much money, they delivered half or sometimes less than half, and therefore it became difficult for the training to go on. I am also very happy that we have doubled the number of instructors in our Tibet institutions. We had 1,300. We have hired another 2,000 Tibet tutors to bring the total trained faculty to 3,300. I still want a conversation with the Tibet uh, um, stakeholders as to whether we have the optimal numbers or we still need to do something about uh, the terms of service and all other requirements for us to be able to make sure that we are training our young people well. Let me also announce here that we have since concluded another program of about 13 billion shillings to equip another 70 Tibet institutions with state-of-the-art facilities, again, to provide training for world-class exposure in the course of their learning. I want uh, my peers, Moria, to clearly understand that this Tibet institutions will be facilitated and I want a clearer program on the delivery of this state-of-the-art equipment. I want to thank Germany for what they have done in other Tibet institutions. I want to thank Canada for what they have done in some of our Tibet institutions. And I want the ministry to work with Tibet managers so that we can carefully identify institutions that will benefit from the supply of our new equipment into different parts of Kenya. Let me also say that we have established 213 Jitume centers in various parts of the country, complete with 370 trained tutors to support young people in preparing for and accessing digital jobs. So far, 516,000 young people have been trained and 152,000 digital jobs successfully accessed. I was very happy this morning to speak to Ann and to speak to Samson, some of the students who are, some of the uh, uh, graduates of our training program, that today they are monetizing their skills. They are working online. And I was asking Samson because many people do not believe that there are digital opportunities, digital jobs in that space. And I got a confirmation from Samson and many others that indeed they are monetizing their talent, they are working online, and we are framing that space. I have already uh, worked with our members of parliament, we have changed the law, and we are going to have a digital hub that can support between two and three hundred students in every ward in the Republic of Kenya. The chairman of uh, the ICT committee, my good friend, the MP for this uh, area, uh, KJ, is right here. And I am working with him and the CDF committee to make sure that every ward in Kenya will have a working, equipped ICT hub. The CDF will construct the building. The government of Kenya will deliver internet. We are going to deliver computers. We are going to provide trainers. And young people from across Kenya will get an opportunity to monetize their talent in those spaces.
I am aware that it is difficult to tell the story of 100 years of Tibet in Kenya in such a brief period. What I wish to underscore is our total commitment to quality, equity, and inclusivity in preparing our young people to access local and global opportunities. Another principle that has enabled us to achieve such and much in transforming our Tibet system is partnership. We have benefited greatly from the goodwill of generous friends, including Tibet Technical Working Group, the United Nations Habitat, the International Labour Organization, World Bank, GIZ, Colleges Institute, Canada, China, and Finland. We are grateful for their support and for this historic transformation that we have achieved together. I urge young people, especially graduates, from our tertiary institutions to pay close attention to the unfolding opportunities that have been unlocked through our overseas employment opportunities strategy and bilateral labor agreements with various governments. I think you've just heard a testimony from the ambassador of Germany that in September this year, we will be signing the first ever bilateral labor ag and migration agreement between Germany and any other country. And that will unlock huge opportunities for our young people to get jobs in different parts of Germany and also give ourselves an opportunity uh, to work with other countries. The State Department of Diaspora Affairs is spearheading the Kazi Maju program and the National Employment Agency maintains an up-to-date database on available opportunities. I encourage you to look up your opportunity and get ready to work your way to success, either in Kenya or outside Kenya. Let me also say the following, because we need to categorically state what we are doing to be able to provide more opportunities especially for those who have acquired skills, who have competencies from our colleges, from our universities. Um, the housing program is a very deliberate program for us to unlock thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs for those who are graduating from our schools and colleges and universities. Already, we have 160,000 people working in our housing program. Last uh, two weeks, in the newspapers, we announced another 4,000 opportunities for students from our Tibets or graduates from our Tibets and universities to provide professional expertise in our housing programs and market programs around Kenya. We are expecting architects, we are expecting quantity surveyors, we are expecting those who have learned um, uh, on, on, on many other supervisory skills to participate in that program as we grow jobs in that space. Let me also say, when I went through the uh, program here, another young man called Anthony was talking to me about industrial automation. And again, Manufacturing, industrialization is a space we must be very keen about. And I have made deliberate policy interventions to expand opportunities in our manufacturing and industrial space. Last year, for example, we said that we are going to reduce on the imports of clinker of cement, of steel, of furniture. What happened when we did that and we imposed duty on imported clinkers, cement, furniture that we can manufacture locally? On steel alone, 11 companies that, has clo that had closed down started operations, employing 16,000 Kenyans. And we stopped the imports 
of steel billets and saved 100 billion Kenya shillings on foreign exchange. Apart from creating jobs, we saved on foreign exchange and we created wealth and job opportunities locally by making sure that we deliberately promote local manufacture. In the same space, we stop the importation of clinker so that we can manufacture clinker locally. We not only saved 20 billion of foreign exchange, we actually exported clinker from Kenya and made 10 billion shillings to the region. Apart from creating jobs locally and reducing the import of clinker by 95%. I went to open the factory in West Pokot which now employs close to 2,500 people directly and another 2,500 people indirectly and giving ourselves the opportunity to use local raw materials to manufacture our own cement, our own clinker, create jobs locally, create wealth locally and stop hemorrhage from our foreign exchange. We must be deliberate. We must be intentional, whether it is with housing, whether it is with our manufacturing, whether it is with our digital jobs, and whether it is in um, our export of labor. We must be intentional on creating opportunities for young people in Kenya to work, either at home or abroad, so that we can enhance their incomes and give them opportunities to be the best of who they, they are. I also take this opportunity to thank trainees at our Tibet colleges for their sterling contribution to the national tree planting drive. So far, you have planted 3.8 million trees, exceeding the initial target of 500,000. I don't know who gave you this small target of 500,000. I think the target was very low, but you've done well. I am honored to call the young people of Kenya heroic partners in our effort to combat deforestation and climate change. A hundred years of Tibet in Kenya have been marked by relentless transformation, strong partnerships, robust endowment, and incremental opportunities. Today, we gather here where it all began, to envision the future over the next hundred years. I say in confidence, that standing on the platform of this excellent legacy, Tibet will power Kenya to the age of global competitiveness in industrialization, technology, and innovation. Let us therefore remain focused on our transformation agenda and the important course of endowing Kenya with a skills capital through equity, quality, and inclusivity. I am very confident that together, working together, we should be able to get our act in the right place and take Kenya to the next level. Thank you very much. My, very, uh, 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 my congratulations to all of you. God bless you and God bless our great country, Kenya. Asante Nisan. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And together with Celebrating 100, there is the launch of the Centenary Block Model and Strategic Plan 2023, which we'll do from there. But allow me to invite the Prime Cabinet Secretary, the PSS President, uh, the German Ambassador to uh, flank His Excellency as we now launch the Centenary Block and Strategic Plan 2023-2027 at the count of five. Uh, so if we can... I think let's join His Excellency on stage. Just uh, the PS is present and uh, the German Ambassador and the Prime Cabinet Secretary. The rest we can all witness from where we are so that we are not too many. And I'll count down by five so that we have the launch in five, four, three, two, one. And what we have there now is the launch of the Centenary Block Model and the Strategic Plan 